Thanks, Leonie, and thanks everybody for joining us for this webinar this afternoon. Basically, I want to go through a little bit about the biology of fall armyworm uh, distribution, uh, why it's suddenly become an issue here in Australia when it hasn't been previously, a little bit about the host plants and also the damage uh, that fall armyworm can cause. The fall armyworm is you know, quite typical of other noctuid moths. It's uh, a very much a similar life cycle. Uh, as with all insects, the duration of the life cycle for fall armyworm is very temperature dependent. The hotter it is within reason, the faster it develops. Uh, typically, the developmental period from egg through to adult will be between 24 and 55 days. The mature larvae get up to about 35 millimetres in size. The uh, female fall armyworm moth can lay up to a thousand eggs during its lifetime, usually in batches of, uh, of 50 to 100. Um, those eggs will ultimately hatch and there will be six larval stages. Uh, those larval stages get progressively bigger in size and of course it's the larval stage that does the damage to the crops. The um, larvae ultimately pupate and in most cases the pupae uh, will be in the soil. In some cases with crops such as maize you can get pupation actually within the maize cobs and some uh, growers will be familiar with that uh, from Heliothus, a similar thing occurs there. Now the big uh, and perhaps one of the saving graces for us in most of New South Wales anyway is that fall armyworm is a tropical to subtropical species. It can only survive relatively mild winters. If you have a really a really good cold winter you will not get any survival and that's largely because um, the pupae cannot enter into a diapause in the soil in response to low temperatures. So typically a tropical to subtropical pest uh, and as a consequence, it's probably going to cause a lot more problems in Queensland, uh, the Northern Territory and the Northern part of Western Australia than it will in New South Wales. But we do have to be uh, alert and I'll explain why. This is a little bit about the spread of fall armyworm. Fall armyworm is a native insect in the southern parts of the United States, uh, Central America through Mexico and down into South America as far as Argentina. It was confined to those areas for a, a long period of time and in 2016 it turned up in West Africa. I haven't heard a, a compelling argument as to how it got there but uh, it certainly did and uh, as it spread through uh, southern Africa it caused tremendous problems particularly for uh, subsistence maize growers. Maize is one of the most vulnerable crops uh, to fall armyworm so it was causing a lot of, uh, a lot of grief there and it moved across uh, Africa quite rapidly. Uh, it turned up in India in uh, 2018 and it wasn't long before it had spread further east into most of Southeast Asia uh, across 2018-2019. This particular graphic is a little bit out of date in that it doesn't show the movement down into Australia. Um, it turned up here fairly recently, it moved across the Torres Strait or at least that was our first detections of it. Uh, it's now found in the top of Western Australia, it's also known from the Northern Territory and in Queensland it's now uh, known from as far south as Bundaberg and that was uh, mid-April progress. This is a uh, one of several modelling exercises that has, uh, has predicted the spread of fall armyworm. Uh, this one shows uh, sort of South America, southern part of the USA which is the native host of uh, native uh, distribution of fall armyworm. As you move across into Africa you can see that the darker the colours the more suitable the area is as a uh, as a habitat for fall armyworm. So basically the central areas of Africa are the most uh, most vulnerable except for high altitudes. You get across into uh, to Southeast Asia and it's places like Vietnam, Cambodia that you can see there with the darkest coloration that are the most, uh, most susceptible or most vulnerable providing the best habitats for the insect. In this particular map when you get down to Australia you can see that the darkest areas are on the Queensland coastal area, uh, southern to mid Queensland and to some extent northern Queensland and also over in the Ord area. There's, there's small areas of darker uh, coloration on the map in uh, the south of Western Australia as well. Uh, one thing here, it shows that a lot of New South Wales appears to uh, be in that grey coloration which says not suitable. Now this is a, a model that um, uses a particular set of data and assumptions and there are considerably uh, more developed models around 
and this is probably the best one that we have. This is from CSIRO. I use a CSIRO software uh, known as Climax, and it takes into account all sorts of uh, all sorts of different variables as well as climate. Where you can see the uh, the white areas in the middle of Australia, there's believed to be no population growth of fall armyworm will occur in those areas. A combination of climate and also availability of of, uh, of food plants and sufficient moisture and so on. If we go next to the pink areas, that's where fall armyworm could appear uh, as a response of migratory movements, but you wouldn't get a full generation there. Essentially, the, the heat accumulations across spring and summer are not enough for uh, a full generation of fall armyworm to, to get through to adulthood. Uh, next up is the green areas. And this, these are areas, and you can see a lot of New South Wales, with the exception of the far north coast, is pretty much in this green category. Now, what that means is that you can have migratory movements of moths into this area. You could have one or more complete generations of moths over the warmer periods, but once again, they will not survive in winter. As you go up into yellow, uh, orange, and then red, uh, as you move further north and up into Queensland, these habitats become progressively more suitable and anything from yellow upwards suggests that the moth could maintain populations there year round. They will not die out during winter. So in New South Wales, that's really the, the, the far northeast corner. So in a lot of the cropping areas in the, the inland parts of New South Wales, we're vulnerable to fall armyworm based on the current models, but that will come about through the migration and movement of adult moths from that northeastern area or southeastern Queensland where the moths can persist all year. So in one respect, we're, we're fortunate in that in a lot of New South Wales, the moths cannot uh, maintain a presence uh, throughout the entire year because of the colder winters. Uh, on the downside, however, fall armyworm adults are particularly strong flyers. Uh, they've moved with what appears to be fairly astonishing speed from Cape York down as far as Bundaberg in a matter of a couple of months. Uh, and the adults are known to fly up to 100 kilometres overnight and over 1,000 kilometres during their lifetime. So we are vulnerable to these migratory movements uh, of moths uh, during spring uh, from areas where they've persisted over winter. One feature of more localised dispersal that you get with fall armyworm is the ballooning, if you like, of first instar larvae. So when the, the eggs hatch and produce these larvae, you can see on the right-hand photograph there, uh, they will come down on a silken filament and that will detach from the plant and they will basically be blown around uh, randomly on the wind uh, in much the same way as, as some young spiders that you see move around as well. So those movements are totally random and short range as opposed to the adult moths, which uh, can cover a lot of ground. So in terms of the number of host plants that are affected, uh, looking at cropping plants here, there's over 80 plants recorded. So it's a quite diverse range of plants. If, if we look at non-crop plants as well, I think the total's in the order of about 350 different plant species that fall armyworm uh, will feed on. But far and away, the worst damage uh, to crops involves grass-based crops. So things like maize, uh, sorghum, wheat, barley, rice, oats, sugarcane, are uh, all uh, potentially very badly affected. Uh, other crops like soybeans, lucerne and, and clover pastures can be affected as well. Um, the only vegetable, whilst well, a lot of vegetables we fed on, it's only regarded as a, a really serious pest of sweet corn in the vegetable area. Uh, cotton is a host of, uh, of fall armyworm. But of course, most of the cotton we produce in Australia now is uh, BT transgenic cotton. Um, as a defence against heliothis, and that uh, the fact that it's BT transgenic means that it's unlikely to be significantly damaged by fall armyworm, though any uh, refugia crops uh, for resistance management that involve non-BT uh, cotton are likely to be uh, affected by fall armyworm. There are a couple of different biotypes of fall armyworm that are known to occur. Uh, and at the minute, the, uh, the judges are still out on which variety or which biotype we have here in Australia. Uh, they do hybridise, so it's not a very simple uh, question to answer at this point.
there's, as I said, a very large number of crops that are affected by full armyworm and it's um, not within the scope of today's webinar to go through and talk about the specific sorts of damage to, to uh, more than a couple of crops. So in this presentation, I'm just going to show a few pictures of the damage that occurs to maize uh, and sweet corn damage is pretty much identical and also damage to rice. Uh, as these are, are two of the very significant crops uh, most severely affected. If you look at the top left picture here with the damage to maize, you can see newly hatched uh, first instar or possibly second instar larvae and they're grazing away on the surface of the maize leaf and they're creating this sort of windowing effect as they remove the top layer of the leaf tissue. They're not actually mining below the epidermis of the leaf, they're grazing across the top of it. The picture at the bottom left shows a very heavily affected maize plant. The, the crown is, uh, is shown there or what's left of it and you can see that a lot of the, uh, the leaves surrounding it have uh, been either shot hold or uh, had the edges uh, grazed on by the larvae. You can actually see a lot of uh, frass or, or droppings from the caterpillars, uh, particularly on that leaf on the right in that picture. The, the center, central picture is a mature uh, fall armyworm larvae showing the sort of shot hole damage it produces in maize leaves and on the right we've got a couple of the larvae that are burrowing into the cob in a very similar style to, uh, to Heliothus. Here's uh, an indication of what they can do to rice crops as well. This is in the southern part of the United States. Uh, shot on the left shows the typical sort of damage with, uh, with sawtooth uh, cuts on the end of the rice leaves or sections taken out on one side of the midrib. Uh, the central picture is in a, a crop that's been flooded uh, and that gives you some idea of the sort of densities of larvae that you can get on individual plants if there's a, a heavy infestation in a crop like rice. Uh, on the right, we've got a, uh, a crop that's either been drained or it's between flushes in an irrigated uh, situation. Uh, when you don't have any water on the crop, you can actually get very large groups of uh, armyworm moving from pastures and so on into crops like rice and producing this very severe damage along the edge of the crop. As for control of fall armyworm, uh, in a lot of countries where fall armyworm is uh, present and particularly in its native range, predators and parasitoids uh, can, be, uh, can be very effective for providing control, provided that they're conserved by minimising the use of, uh, of the broader spectrum insecticides like pyrethroids and so on. Just how effective are native Australian beneficial species for fall armyworm control is not yet known. Certainly with our other armyworm species that we have in Australia, uh, things like common armyworm and so on, we do get very high levels of uh, parasitism and quite significant levels of predation. But whether our native uh, beneficial insects can adapt to, uh, to feeding on fall armyworm is really something that we're, we're only going to find out with a bit of time. Now, until we know a bit more about fall armyworm, um, and what sort of damage it is causing to our crops and, and the level of natural control that we can achieve, insecticides are going to pay, play a very significant role for fall armyworm control in Australia. Um, the key to using insecticides effectively, and Janine will be talking about um, permits and so on later on, is regular crop monitoring. Uh, populations of armyworm, whether they're fall armyworm or whether they're some other species, one of our native species perhaps, they can build up very quickly before, uh, before growers are aware of the population levels that are developing, particularly in hot weather, and, um, and they can do a lot of damage uh, very swiftly. So regular crop monitoring is very important. Another aspect of crop monitoring is that in general with most of these caterpillars and fall armyworm, if you can spray when the caterpillars are smaller, uh, any chemical spray is most likely to be more effective at that time. The larger the caterpillars, the greater the, the tolerance to uh, insecticide doses, generally speaking. I'd just like to, at this point, um, give some credit here to a lot of the organisations uh, uh, who have whose material we've used in these presentations. Thank you.